Good uh, morning, everybody. Welcome to the third uh, day of uh, our Inspire School. This year uh, we are only online due to the sanitary situation, but uh, we are really eager to say that uh, the participation is, uh, is not uh, uh, so small. So thank you everybody who are connected. And uh, let me introduce the subject of the today's session that uh, is uh, entirely devoted uh, to uh, nanotechnology. And the first speaker of, uh, of today is uh, uh, Dr. Stefano Bellucci. Uh, Stefano is a senior researcher of the National Institute of uh, Nuclear Physics. He started his, uh, his uh, career as a theoretical physicist, and uh, more recently he moved uh, to this uh, subject of, uh, of nanomaterials and uh, he became a real expert in this field. So uh, you will uh, have the chance to, to learn a lot about uh, uh, nanomaterials and above all about uh, nanomaterials used for biomedicine. So please, uh, Stefano, uh, take the floor and tell us uh, all the beauty of this uh, subject. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about nanomaterials uh, for biological and medical applications. Um, okay, I'm, I have written here that I'm leading this uh, next group, which I founded uh, in, um, in the year 2000, so about 20 years ago. That's when I made the transition to uh, nanotechnology in my career. So now... Uh, where, where should we have been uh, is given in this slide. This is the largest uh, national laboratory of the National Institute of Nuclear Physics in Italy. And uh, okay, here is where I normally work. Um, now, my group has been working, as I said, for two decades. That explains uh, why uh, the wide variety of uh, subjects that we've been considering uh, with nanoscience and nanotechnological application of this science. So here you see on the top, you see the uh, synthesis of different nanomaterials. As you move to the left anticlockwise, you see that we are equipped to observe by micro microscopic characterizations as well as spectroscopic characterizations in-house, in my lab, uh, our nanoparticles. Then we have a strong uh, vocation for theory, modeling, and also the computer simulation of our structures and their physical and chemical properties. And the applications range from sensors. In Today, I will speak particularly of bio uh, sensors, but there are sensors also to gases or to other types of analytes, not necessarily bio, of biological interest, that we are normally working on. And true, uh, genuine medical applications that have to do, on the one hand, with toxicology, that is explained uh, from the caution in approaching these new materials, the campus um, threats to the, um, to the health of uh, the, the, the professionally exposed workers, to my students, to myself and others. And so we have to keep this under uh, control by examining the biocompatibility of the materials we produce. Once we test this biocompatibility, we are going to use the nanoparticles also for controlled and targeted delivery of drugs of interest. There are also electronic applications that we've been working on for many years, financed also by the European Union very widely, very largely, and that have to do with interconnects, nanocomposite materials, that's a special type of materials that include nanoparticles and have applications in, uh, for instance, in space science or in aeronautics, or even in, um, in uh, commercial products. And so I now uh, give you, first of all, an introduction to, the, to what is a nanoparticle and how it can be used and how, in fact, it is already in use in our society since uh, many, many years. You will be surprised how much nanotechnology has already penetrated in our everyday life. And here you see 
the wide range of applications of nanoparticles, nanoparticles are put at the center of this type of um, structure, concentrical circles. In the next circle, I have put different areas of application from textile to biomedical to genuine healthcare to applications in agriculture and food, not only production, but also packaging, true genuine industrial, hard industrial application from the production of industrial additives to uh, pigments for paints, for instance. Uh, needless to say that the most successful commercial application of uh, uh, nanoparticles has been historically developed in the 90s by a multi an American and a US multinational company that developed paint based on titania, on nanoparticles of uh, titanium dioxide. Electronics applications I've already mentioned, and they are now present practically in all electronics equipments. Environmental applications for detecting uh, pollution and also introducing um, suitable filters for water pollution remediation and more recently air pollution remediation. I must say that uh, the soil treatment is um, uh, probably what needs to be more developed at this point, but um, it is a little bit um, lagging behind in research worldwide. And finally, renewable sources of energy. Let me give a first definition of what is nanotechnology. I've, I've written here, it is the science of manipulating matter at the atomic and molecular level with the aim to achieve materials and devices, I should, I should add, which have specifically enhanced properties from the chemical and the physical point of view. I've, I've written here uh, essentially uh, four areas. Uh, I've reported four areas. There are the areas where um, the major innovations are on the one hand necessary, on the other hand, potentially provided by the help of um, nanoparticles used. So IT, where we need to have smaller, faster, and especially energy efficient uh, IT systems, information technology systems, to medicine. We will deal with this practically throughout the course of this uh, uh, talk. We will discuss uh, treatment of uh, cancer diseases, how to apply nanoparticles to uh, the treatment of uh, bone problems, drug delivery, and so on. Uh, Diagnostics is a particularly important topic, and we will see there are uh, applications I will not discuss for lack of time, like uh, the improvement of imaging, for instance, echography, uh, by using nano, uh, nano devices and nanoparticles. Then energy. Energy, of course, uh, is one of the most wanted uh, applications in our society. We have a greed and a hunger for a production of energy to replace uh, to replace the conventional uh, fossil fuels with no, with um, uh, renewable uh, sources of energy. And nanoparticles potentially can help uh, solar cells as well as batteries a lot. In my group, we are working currently on batteries uh, using carbon nanomaterials. And finally, consumer goods already include nanoparticles from the foods and beverages where the nanoparticles are already used to obtain advanced packaging materials to put sensors on our um, miniaturized sensors on our packaging so that we can, for instance, ascertain whether uh, a good, a frozen good, has been preserved uh, in uh, a proper way or has it been out of the fridge, uh, for out of the freezer for some time. We can put a sensor that will label and register uh, the history of the product. Uh, other applications that are interesting, we'll discuss them, uh, have to do with uh, smart textiles, textiles that can be stain-proof, waterproof, and wrinkle-proof and wrinkle-free. Uh, household and cosmetics are already including, uh, for instance, in uh, sunscreens, uh, nanoparticles. What are the basics of nanotechnology? Why nanotechnology is working so well? First of all, as I said, you work at a very, very small level, very near the atomic level. And the scale of the lengths ranges between 1 and 100 nanometers. We're going to see immediately in more concrete terms what does that mean. But let me stress that uh, the, aim, uh, of the, of the, um, uh, the aim of the nanotechnology application 
is not only to achieve very small devices, very small meaning what I said in the previous point, scale of length between one and 100 nanometers, but to achieve the realization of a device where having such a small structure, at least in one of the three space dimensions, yields fundamentally innovative properties. So nanotechnology means that because we have a thin field or a small particle, then we have a new property, a new uh, property that we can use to our advantage. What is the reason? I promise to explain. It's very simple. It's a very large surface to volume ratio. That means that we have an extremely large surface area in a nanoparticle. For uh, fixing ideas, uh, imagine that um, uh, a particle, let's say not nano, but more like microparticle, of 300 nanometers diameter um, has uh, a, well, substantial but not extremely high number of atoms placed on its surface. That means 5% of its atoms are placed on the surface. If you only scale down by factor 10, from 300 nanometers down to a smaller diameter of 30 nanometers, thus entering truly the range of nanotechnology, then the percentage of the surface atoms is tenfold, is multiplied by factor of 10, and becomes half of the total number of atoms. That explains why the, uh, nanoparticles have such incredible uh, properties that I will try to illustrate in the next, in the next part of my talk. And here is a, is a classic example taken from the internet uh, where you start from a cube of gold with one meter uh, side. Uh, the total surface is easily calculated is six square meters and can be covering the, for instance, the, 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 the floor of a very small room, eight feet by eight feet because it's taken from the US uh, site. Uh, now, if you break the side of the cube into four parts, then you uh, multiply the uh, surface by a factor of four. You scale up from six to 24 square meters. If you imagine repeating this operation until you get to a very tiny size, that is one nanometer, then the mass remains the same, but the total surface is enhanced to about 4,000 uh, square kilometers or 2.5 thousand square miles that would cover the surface of a, a, a medium-sized state in the United States or in Italy a, a medium-sized region so I promise to explain what is a nanometer it's readily said it's a millionth part of a millimeter or if you want is a, a, a um, 1,000 times smaller than a micron imagine a micron is about uh, one fiftieth of the thickness of your of a, of a human hair. One nanometer is as big as a few, uh, a layer of few atoms, three to five, because remember an atom has a scale uh, that is typically on the angstrom. An angstrom is the 10th part of a nanometer. Here you see a scale that ranges from the atom on the angstrom uh, scale, 10 times uh, larger, you get to small dye molecules, about one nanometer, and then you go higher and higher and meet different systems, physical or biological systems like proteins. And then you get to a bacterium. A bacterium is about one micron and animal cells are about 10 micron. Uh, a virus, because now, nowadays we talk a lot about viruses, are typically a few hundred uh, uh, nanometers. So about um, between the colloidal gold particles and the bacterium. So if we want to compare this size to the human size, you can start with a tall man, about two meters tall, reduced by a factor 1,000 its uh, size, get down to the size of an insect, like a mosquito, is about two millimeters, reduced by a factor 1,000, and we get to a feature of the mosquito, of the mosquito like its um, eye, is about two micron size. If you get down by additional factor 1,000, you get uh, now finally to the basis of life. Uh, that is the DNA. The DNA typical um, uh, molecule uh, size is two nanometers. So all in all, we have uh, proceeded to divide by a factor 1 billion uh, the, the size of a human being to get down 
to uh, the basis of um, uh, living organisms, that is the DNA, and it is a truly nanometric object. Now, in nanotechnology, we have available two routes, two ways of realizing uh, nanoparticles, a top-down and a bottom-up strategy. In the top-down, you simply break a macroscopic object in very tiny fragments until you get down to the size of the nanometer, let's say 100 nanometers or less. See here an image uh, which is uh, made in silicon. Uh, it has been excavated by a beam and uh, this beam um, produces tiny features in the London Bridge. So these tiny features are nanometric. And on the right hand side, you see a bottom up approach example. You can imagine, you can figure it out as a kind of a Lego system assembly. Here, nanofibers, in this case, are carbon nanofibers. They've been uh, self-assembled to realize a knot, so a topologically non-trivial configuration. In my group, we've been pursuing mostly the bottom-up approach, on the one hand, because the top-down requires um, instrumentation that is very costly, like uh, transmission electron microscopes, like um, nano assembler, nano, um, uh, elect uh, nano beams, and so on. On the other hand, uh, it is also, in my opinion, uh, the approach that is more easily scalable to the industrial application. So with an eye to not only doing, carrying out uh, base, you know, basic research, but also trying to develop concrete applications for society, we um, favor this bottom-up approach. And here you see two books that we've been publishing, we've been publishing in the past to uh, put together the experiences that have been done by my group and collaborators uh, in these areas. Now, nanotechnology is not entirely new uh, in the sense that unintentionally, uh, ancient uh, people were already practicing nanotechnology. Here you see uh, an artist uh, named Lycurgus, who was also a, a good material scientist. In the fourth century of the current era, produced this cup, which is nowadays, nowadays preserved at the British Museum in the UK. Uh, this has an interesting feature uh, that is uh, if you use light uh, in reflection, that means you put a source of light outside of the cup, then the cup looks green. If you put the source of light inside, then the cup looks red. That is due to the presence of nanoparticles of noble metals, in particular gold and silver, inside the glass paste. So here you see a TEM, transmission electron microscope image of the nanoparticles that are present in the Lycurgus cup. Also in the Middle Age, things went on with using nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles of different types of uh, elements were put in the stained glass windows of medieval churches. Uh, on the right top, you see an image of the transmission electron microscope of the nanoparticles that are present in the in the composite, in the glass composite, you see that they are very small. We talk about 10 uh, or 15 nanometers diameter. And you see also that they are structured inside. So they have a crystalline structure and uh, I don't want to get into too many details. Just let me convey the message that this type of uh, technology is uh, obviously uh, of the top down kind. You see here the pestle and mortar that these people were using to uh, obtain nanoparticles with a grinding process that lasted a long time. So that's a top-down example. How do we see this uh, type of uh, arrangements at the atomic level? There have been in the past, uh, let me see, there have been in the past, uh, in the recent past, in 1990s, uh, there have been uh, striking results obtained by the IBM group uh, which were able, this group was able to arrange 35 atom, atoms of xenon on a nickel surface with a certain lattice structure, 110 in particular, uh, of course, at very, very low temperature. Otherwise, the atoms would vibrate and would move around a lot, would oscillate a lot. So uh, they decided that to put them in an order structure, for instance, in this case, IBM. It took about 22 hours to complete this image. That was an, a, an opposite type of approach. It was a bottom-up approach, as we will see in a minute. And it was achieved using uh, an STM, a scanning tunneling microscope. 
powerful instrument at the time totally new developed by this group on the bottom you see near the near the kid who's observing with a standard optical microscope which of course is not an electronic microscope it's not enough to observe um, uh, nanoparticles i put it here just for fun um you see another type of microscope that is an atomic force microscope uh, briefly afm which scans the surface of uh, a film and uh, identifies the roughness the the highs and lows on the surface by using a laser beam that hits hits a cantilever um, equipped with a tip this tip is scanning in different modes tapping uh, contact non-contact and it can give us the characteristic the very time features of the surface up to the atomic layer with, ato with, with atomic level precision here you see how the film uh, how the sorry the ibm was made ibm was written starting from a disordered assembly of atoms and then progressively ordering them using an stm about 22 hours another curiosity in 2013 uh, the smallest film in the world was realized i challenge you to make a, a, a film that is smaller than that it's entitled a boy and its atom it was made again at ibm and you see a boy made of atoms in this case it's again silicon uh, i think silicon atoms on uh, some substrate but i'm not sure and here an atom is coming and the boy is playing successfully now let's get into uh, some more specific topic that is uh, the use of uh, carbon in uh, nanotechnology carbon is the basics for life so no surprise that we're going to use uh, such abundant uh, and useful elements for realizing uh, systems and uh, devices at the nanoscale. Now, on the left um, bottom, you see the diamonds, which is a cubic, uh, cubic lattice. It has special optical properties. I'm not going to spend time on it, uh, like total refraction that make it um, interesting from the commercial point of view. But uh, you're more familiar with uh, graphite. Graphite is um, given at the center of the diagram of the carbon family. It's another allotropic uh, state of carbon. And it's interesting because it has uh, a very strong bond on the XY direction, on the planar direction, whereas uh, the different planes uh, that make the graphite are only weakly bound uh, uh, one to the, uh, to, the neighbor, to the neighboring one. So it's easy to separate the layers of graphite. And in this sense, uh, one can think of obtaining uh, what is put on the top right corner of the picture, namely graphene. That would be a single layer with atomic uh, thickness uh, of, the, the, of the layers that make the, the graphite. However, it was the last one to be discovered only in the, in the 2000s because uh with, with a very simple uh, way and we will discuss it later on because before in the 80s fullerene was obtained starting from graphite the fullerene is not made purely of hexagonal lattice like graphite or graphene is made rather by a mixture of uh, hexagons and pentagons without the pentagons which are you can think of them as a defective hexagon where one of the atomic links has been removed uh, these defective sites are necessary to obtain a curved structure. Otherwise, you will never close the structure to form a ball. This fullerene is also called buckyball. Uh, it's due to the, it's in honor of an uh, US uh, architect who used to create in the 1940s uh, architectural structures, for instance, um, covering of uh, swimming pools or gymnasiums or things like that in different American universities using this structure, hexagons and pentagons, let's say half of a fullerene molecule. The smallest molecule made obviously of uh, carbon atoms is made of 60 atoms, and that is why it's called C60, but there are C120 and bigger molecules. Let's move to the last picture uh, on this slide, that is the carbon nanotube on the topmost uh, left um, uh, picture. Uh, you see here that is essentially a structure you can think of uh, uh, obtaining by starting with a graphene layer and rolling it up in cylindrical uh, shape, namely defining uh, an axis of symmetry and then rolling up the, the plane 
around this cylindrical axis to obtain a single layer carbon nanotube. What is a carbon nanotube? Let's start from that because historically, uh, in the end of the 90s, I started working with carbon nanotubes, first at the theoretical level, then in 2000, starting setting up my laboratory to produce them and use them. It was, they were discovered at the time, they were quite new. They were discovered in the early 90s by Sumio Ijima in uh, Tsukuba in Japan. They're hollow cylinders, long and thin. You can think of them, as I said, as a sheet of graphite or graphene uh, rolled up into a cylinder. And you can have it open or closed. If you close it, you have to use uh, two half molecule of fullerene to, cl to close it. So they can be distinguished in a single wall, as we saw a minute ago. But also, you can create multi-wall nanotubes that are co coaxial cylinders, uh, one, one into the other, a little bit like Russian dolls. More or less, the features are similar in the sense that the long and thin single wall nanotubes have a higher aspect ratio. The aspect ratio is simply the ratio of uh, the, uh, <clears throat> of the um, uh, length over the diameter of the object. So in this case, we're talking about, I don't know, typically 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 micron divided by 1 or 2 nanometers. So we're talking about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 uh, aspect ratio. So it's very, very high, 1 million or 10 million uh, value for the aspect ratio. For the multi-wall, is a little bit smaller because the multi-wall are thicker. Uh, they range between 5 and 200 nanometers, and the length can reach up to even nowadays even a millimeter or a fraction or a millimeter of a millimeter. What's so special in a carbon nanotube? A carbon nanotube has a very high aspect ratio. That means it's a quasi-unidimensional structure. Uh, it has a very in well, terrific uh, mechanical properties. In terms of elasticity, it's uh, young modulus or elastic modulus is about one terapascal, which means uh, orders of magnitude higher than special steels, for instance. It has the ability to carry very high density of current that means that uh, can um, replace uh, copper, which we normally use for, uh, <clears throat> for uh, the transport of current. This can reach up to 10 to the 9 ampere per square centimeter. And finally, it has very, very uh, high thermal conductivity. That means that uh, its thermal properties are suitable, for instance, for uh, space applications in re-entry vehicles that need to uh, realize shields that can sustain the very high temperatures in the re-entry in the atmosphere. How do we realize these carbon nanotubes? Uh, arc discharge, laser ablation, chemical vapor deposition. So uh, we have in our lab arc discharge and chemical vapor deposition. The arc discharge is a physical method based on voltaic arc. The chemical vapor deposition is a chemical method, obviously. Uh, that is based on a precursor that is a gas. It's a carbonaceous gas that is <clears throat> normally decomposed at high temperature, ranging from 600 up to 1,000 uh, Celsius, more or less, depending on the type of material you want to obtain. And, uh, the, and the, the composition of the gas, for instance, methane, uh, CH4, you decompose it and the carbon atom become uh, carbon atoms become available to rearrange in a desired structure, for instance, a carbon tube or uh, graphene. All these can be uh, engineered. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages, but basically, the arc discharge can yield very pure material, which doesn't need any purification using strong acids or other chemical methods, whereas chemical vapor deposition yields, uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, the possibility of realizing large quantities of material, which is more difficult using our discharge. Here you see historically our first chamber that was assembled in my lab in 2001 for realizing carbon nanotubes. Uh, and you see the electrodes are, uh, mm, between the electrodes uh, that are made in pure graphite, a voltaic arc is struck, the temperature very high, thousands of Celsius, uh, uh, very near the axis of the arc. And then uh, you see the nanotubes have magnifications uh, that are increasing uh, by SCM, by scanning electron microscope, up to the level of seeing the individual multi-wall nanotube with 19 
nanometers diameter in this case is a 150,000 times magnified image very nice one you can see how straight the nanotubes are that means that they have very high mechanical properties uh, well i give you here immediately an application that is as old as 2007 the ferrari f2007 that actually with um, raikkonen won the formula one championship that year was a concentrate of nanotech from brakes that contain carbon nanotubes to the car body made of ultralight material that is a composite where carbon nanotubes are in a small percentage inserted as a filler and finally special tire compound that uses carbon nanotubes inside the elastomer the elastomer that makes the matrix of the composite now here what properties are we using well in the brakes and in the compound we are using the thermal properties because these thermal properties are responsible for the high performance of brakes that need to uh, dissipate heat very very fast and the same happens during the brake phase the braking phase and the compound the same the, in the compound you have uh, adhesion to the asphalt is given essentially by the high uh, capability of the compound to dissipate energy and transmit it uh, homogenizing the, the temperature on the tire to avoid breakdown of the tire the, the car body uh, here the use of the carbon nanotubes is essentially because they give very high mechanical properties without uh, putting too much weight in the car because they are hollow so they are very very light uh, here you see an example of the symbiosis car that was presented a few years ago at uh, the car uh, show, um, I think in uh, Paris or in Geneva, I don't remember. That is a collaboration of a U.S. Uh, college in California and a German institute uh, uh, also where students were involved. Essentially, the symbiosis vehicle runs on solar piezoelectric energy because carbon nanotubes, apart from solar cells, uh, that the car is equipped with and the standard cares for uh, recuperation of the um, energy in the braking. But here there are carbon nanotubes on the body of the car because they exploit friction with the air during motion to uh, generate electrostatic uh, currents, that electrostatic charges that then recharge the battery of the vehicle. On the right hand side, you see a flexible mobile presented by Samsung a few years ago. Here, the technology is OLED. OLED is organic light emitting diode, which means that we have an active matrix light emitting diode embodied into the screen. So the pixels uh, are creating their own light source. You don't need a backlight like the standard liquid crystal display screen technology. You have a circuitry that is fused into a very, very tiny a uh, layer of glass that explains the performance and at the same time the flexibility nanotechnology is also normally in use uh, in cultural heritage and here is an example of a fresco in uh, florence where calcium hydroxide nanodispersions has been used have been used for nano cleaning so you see on the right hand side the images at the transmission electron microscope of two nano sized particles that are used in the dispersion or in the suspension and they have different shapes, different structures. The A is a hexagonal, calcium hydroxide. The other one is a carbonate, and it's prismatic. In uh, all these devices, uh, often we uh, use nature as a guidance. So we imitate nature. That is why we have uh, biomimetic uh, devices. You see an example on the left where you see the water droplet on a cotton layer, which has been coated by uh, titania nanoparticles, which are, have a diameter of 100 nanometers or smaller. And this coating allows uh, uh, the, essentially the realization of uh, an artificial imitation of the lotus. The lotus leaf uh, displays the, what the property called lotus effect where the droplet of water cannot be absorbed and remains on the surface of the leaf. And so it happens in this cotton layer. On the right hand side, you see examples of nano cleaning. Uh, you have um, a, a comparison of treated, coated with nanoparticles air and standard uncoated devices that go from uh, concrete walls to 
a handle, for instance, in uh, emergency exit, to uh, tools for work. And uh, in energy, I could speak uh, an hour or two on energy, so I'm not going to give you all the details of batteries or solar cells and how nanoparticles are being used in those devices, but I only give you a curiosity, that is the nano felt or power felt. This power felt is a felt, and it has been uh, surrounded by, um, essentially by an architecture, an electronic architecture that aims at exploiting the difference of temperature between the body of the athlete and the cool air outside. So if we have, this has been developed by Wake Forest University Center for Nanotechnology and Molecular Materials in the US, and it's based on thermoelectric power generation. So what can happen here, thanks to the presence of carbon nanotubes in the power felt, is that in the presence of a, a gradient of temperature of only 17 Celsius, so if the air is about 20 Celsius and uh, the body of the athlete is 37. Then you have a production of uh, 100 millivolt uh, per square meter of felt. This can be enhanced by, of course, uh, increasing the number of layers of felt or increasing the size of the nan na uh, nanotubes that have been used to realize the felt. Uh, another example is in cosmetics. And as I mentioned before, uh, nanoparticles have been inserted into the sunscreen to enhance uh, the UV protection through the dispersion of the nanoparticles inside. Here you see the image of nanoparticles. They show you that the nanoparticles are about four or five nanometers in diameter and their structure, their atomic, uh, their, their, uh, their lattice structure has an inter-layer uh, distance of a little bit more than two angstroms. So I hope I convinced you that nanotechnology has many uses. In this sense, it's very pervasive because in, uh, it can uh, penetrate in different uh, technological areas. It's also enabling technology, like, for instance, an example of enabling technology is uh, electricity. Electricity was um, uh, discovered in the 19th century, essentially, or developed, let's say, was discovered in the century before, but it was uh, developed uh, in the 19th century by Michael Faraday and uh, James Clerk Maxwell uh, for uh, only one application, essentially, illumination of big cities like London. Those are the days of Jack the Ripper. So you need to illuminate much better than with the gas. They were using at the time a city lamp, which has a very low performance. But then once it was discovered already at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the uses uh, multiplicated and we got, mankind got to the level, to a technological level that was completely inconceivable only a few decades before and led to the discovery of computers, uh, radars, uh, uh, smartphones, all of this based on the use of electromagnetism uh, in, a, in a clever way. That is the concept of enabling technology, a technology that leads you to a completely different plane of technological development, enabling you to think and conceive something that was inconceivable before. Uh, it's also an ubiquitous technology because you find it pretty much everywhere, uh, from solar energy to batteries to weapons to instrumentation design and manufacture. In all applicative areas of interest for mankind, nanotech can play a role now or in the medium size, medium time future. That explains why in the next part of my talk, I will concentrate on, first of all, uh, assessing how dangerous it can be. In other words, what can be its impact on environment and on human health, and in particular for people working with it. So now we stop and take up a few of your questions before moving on. Thank you, Stefano, for this very nice uh, overview. Yes, we have many, many questions, so I will try to pick uh, some up. Uh, the, the first one uh, is uh, is really interesting. So you said that these nanoparticles are uh, really uh, very small. So there is a worry that by breathing, uh, this particle can enter our our body and can then uh, interact with the uh, DNA. Can be this true, or can you say something about that? I will uh, devote the second part of my talk to answering this question. Okay, well, then uh, I, I, I 
pose you another question that um, said, uh, can we apply bio uh, nanotechnology for uh, reproducing organs, organ uh, cells? Okay, this, uh, I will not treat this subject because of lack of time. It's a very interesting subject. It's called the realization of scaffolds and uh, cultivation of cells can be achieved using uh, nanostructure scaffolds uh, uh, as a substrate. So the answer is yes. Okay, good. And another one is um, concerning this um, material, these different layers of, uh, of felt, um, is asking if um, adding more layers of felt, uh, um, if the difference in temperature will, will change for every layer. Is this a problem? No, the temperature will not change. I mean, essentially, <clears throat> the, 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 the device is immersed in the same air. So essentially what happens there is that uh, the, in, the increasing of the number of layers will increase uh, uh, the voltage that is produced by the device uh, with the same uh, gradient of temperature. Another way, of course, is to increase the, the gradient of temperature, but that is uh, trivial. Unfeasible, way. yeah. No. And another, yeah. another if question. Run in, if you run in Alaska in the winter, it will happen. <laughs> yes, but it's, but it's okay. <laughs> Not uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, another thing uh, regards, uh, um, they, they, they ask, if you need a material with a certain property, how do you understand which shape you need to give uh, uh, to obtain uh, the, this kind of property? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. It's one of the handles we have to uh, en engineer our nanoparticles. I will show you in the third part of my talk how to create not only a particle of a certain shape that has been engineered for a specific purpose, for instance, penetration inside the cell, uh, but also how we can attach different functional groups to this uh, nanoparticle to make it, for instance, suitable to target a special tissue or a special antibody uh, or a special organ in the human body. And I think we can conclude this uh, question session um, with the, uh, a question concerning IT uh, technology. So at which level, uh, uh, for instance, Intel or other company uh, develop uh, their own computers using uh, the nanotechnology available? That's the most challenging topic in uh, nanotechnology. In fact, already since decades, people have been trying to propose carbon-based circuitry to realize chips, but also more in general, architecture. Architectures, for instance, uh, horizontal or vertical uh, uh, interconnects. The problem with the companies, the semiconducting companies are very reluctant to leave the silicon uh, technology and embrace the carbon-based technology for electronics, that is due to the to, to considerations that have to do with commercial strategy. On the one hand, uh, carbon uh, nanomaterials are still uh, much more risky in terms of uh, uh, obtaining a, a number of devices uh, that are functioning well. A lot of waste is generated and the costs are still too high. So nowadays, a company realizing semiconductors, chips, they can make millions of and millions per day at very low cost, uh, less than a cent each device. So if a fraction of this is defective, they simply throw them away. If you do the same with uh, carbon nanomaterials, the costs are factors of 10 higher. And so you cannot throw them away so easily. And the number of failure, the percentage of failure is not small at all. So that explains why in our computers, you don't have yet a purely carbon-based technology. However, hybrid technologies uh, marrying uh, semiconductor materials based on copper and based on silicon with carbon nanostructures are already being developed, not only by Intel, by, but by other companies, ST, for instance, ST Microelectronics that is a European company. So essentially, it's, it's a matter of time to have more reliable process to realize this, uh, this device. In an optimistic view, I would say yes. Okay. <laughs> so please, Stefano, go ahead and uh, tell us uh, the rest uh, of, your, of your talk, please. Okay. In the thank you. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to assess the impact of nanotechnology on health and the environment so the, the road starts being steeper. 
And uh, here you see, uh, I present you two books that we realized uh, in, the, in 2009 and 2010 for the Italian edition, 2011 for the uh, English edition. In the left-hand side, you see the application of nanoparticle and nanodevices in biology. On the right-hand side, you see the exposure of uh, occupational health uh, workers and uh, to engineered nanomaterials. Remember this word, engineered, we will get into it and safety effects. This was done uh, uh, in coordination with the Italian uh, Institute uh, that uh, devotes its, uh, its activity to the protection of exposure of uh, professionally exposed workers. In Italy, it's called INAIL. And I was the first uh, signer of this white book. Then in 2015, the European Union took up our uh, recommendations on best practices uh, and uh, delivered the direction, uh, directive uh, that was uh, uh, essentially disciplining, uh, uh, norming uh, all the devices that contain nanoparticles uh, defined as objects with one nanometer, 100 nanometers or less in size. And here, by the way, I, I mentioned the problem of uh, fullerene that dissolved in water can bind to DNA and therefore can change its structure and stability. So. Truly, the question that was addressed before is a, is a concern. So what are the grand challenges of nanotechnology in general? Uh, as, we, as you can guess from the fact that these materials are very, very interactive, they have a very high surface to volume ratio, so they interact with the environment a lot, they're difficult to keep them, it's difficult to keep them stable, uh, and not only it's difficult to handle them. Uh, in addition, there is a fundamental difference when you deal with nanoparticles uh, compared to when you deal with uh, much bigger uh, size particles. In other words, a single particle of, for instance, silicon, to pick up an element, does not behave at all like a bulk silicon and needs to be studied. And also needs to be studied not only in the lab, but also when you put in the environment where it's supposed to work, for instance, uh, in, uh, a, in, in a living system. Then... Uh, there is an uh, important imp attention must be paid on the dependence of the properties uh, on the not only the size and the shape, but also on the surroundings of the particle. In this sense, we developed um, in the past few years the notion of bio-corona. Here you see the example. The nanoparticle uh, is made at synthesis, characterized. We know all about its physical, chemical properties. Then, however, it crosses the biological barrier. For instance, being inhaled accidentally or uh, we inject it in a tumor to cure the tumor. So we do it intentionally. In both cases, the nanoparticle changes when it crosses the biological barrier entering the living organism and gets surrounded by a bio-corona, this red thin layer that I put on it, around it. Then normally, this is a feature of almost universal feature of nanoparticles, independent of its shape, but it can be uh, enhanced and fostered by engineering the surface of the nanoparticle as well as its shape. Uh, a phenomenon takes place when the nanoparticle gets close to a cell. Namely, the phenomenon is called endocytosis. Basically, the plasma membrane creates like a pocket and finally a vacuola or a hole is created uh, uh, by lysosome uh, where the nanoparticle is now placed and it stays in the cytoplasm of the cell for a certain time uh, before being uh, uh, kicked out. Uh, this phenomenon is called the exocytosis, where the nanoparticle leaves the, the cell you know, cytoplasm. But notice that the color of the bio-corona is changed. It's changed because proteins, enzymes uh, are put by the cell around the uh, nanoparticle. So we need to study all this. And in particular, you see here nanoparticles produced during the combustion process accidentally. And that can be studied both epidemiologically as well as toxicologically. We have nanoparticles that are used intentionally in industry, for instance, as uh, industrial additives. And that gives a nanotechnological uh, machinery. In all these cases, we are driven by the application because, of course, we aim at very uh, high performance. But on the other hand, we need to have in mind toxicological prescriptions and industrial hygiene strategies, and that requires the introduction of norms and regulations that have been 
already studied and are currently studied in the uh, in the highest uh, political instances. Okay, here you see examples of our studies in 2008, for instance, on toxicity. We studied the proliferation of cells, uh, how it is changed by the presence of multi-wall carbon nanotubes using human arterial smooth muscle cells, uh, HSMCs. Now, uh, applications uh, uh, can also, for instance, uh, in this work that we published in uh, Sensors and Microsystems in 2011, can also have to do with the use of films of carbon nanotubes to cure uh, skin cancer, for instance, by applications of patches. And here, the toxicity is, uh, is working to our advantage, especially the type of toxicity that is called um, uh, apoptosis or programmed death of the cells. But we are entering now the, the, the kingdom of nanomedicine. What is nanomedicine? We define nanomedicine as a way to preserve and improve human health using nanotechnology, using molecular tools and molecular knowledge of the human body. Now, in this sense, nanomedicine can be conceived as a single cell medicine, a medicine capable of curing a single cell. And so it pairs up with the uh, fantastic applications we can have from nanoparticles once we engineer their surface. For instance, here you see uh, uses that we already mentioned before, uh, through which the a surface that have been treated by a coating of nanoparticles becomes uh, totally, <clears throat> Um, how to say, uh, cannot be affected by water. And the same in uh, displays where the surface is free from adhesion of, for instance, um, dirt or, uh, uh, or uh, fingerprints. Now, to achieve uh, a nano device that will be able to uh, be used uh, for therapeutic or diagnostic uh, uh, aims, uh, we can conceive the following scheme. We can prepare a nano vector with, with a, a certain degree of complexity. Here I've introduced oligonucleotides, for instance, as a drug. I have put a chromophore that allows me to monitor where the vector in the body is going. I put a contrast agent that allows me to increase the monitoring by imaging, uh, enhancing the contrast of the image. And finally, I put an antibody to achieve the targeting uh, towards a special, uh, specific organ. So nanotubes in general now appear, or nanomaterials, I, I use nanotubes as, a, as an epitome for any nanoparticle, appears to have physical chemical properties that we can assess in the lab when we create it or modify it. But then it is further modified by the pharmaceutical uh, intervention. For instance, uh, pharmacologists can put a drug on it and then it is studied both from a biological point of view, in vitro or in vivo, as well as in clinical tests by a, a medical doctor. General nanomaterials can be very complex objects because uh, they can be made uh, and engineered to carry on their surface proteins, DNA, fluorescent tags. So possibilities become infinitely many when you consider that you can add organic as well as inorganic functional groups on the surface of the nanoparticle. And here you have a final scheme uh, of a multifunctional nanoparticle. On this particle, I'd imagine to put two types of drugs, red and blue, a contrast enhancer. What is a contrast enhancer? We have already hinted before, namely some <clears throat> molecule that will allow me to enhance the contrast of imaging device, a permeation enhancer that allows me to um, enter more easily into cells as well as remain for a longer time in the hematic uh, uh, torrent, uh, in the hematic stream, so that we can <clears throat> have the particle running in, uh, in, the, um, in the blood circulation for a long time, so that with this stabilizing element, uh, the probability that the drug will be delivered where it needs to be delivered will be enhanced. We can have also targeting moieties or uh, polyglycol, polyethylene glycol as a biological surface modifier so that we can really end up dock into some specific receptor uh, that will constitute an interest for us. For instance, we want to, to target the liver, we want to target 
the brain, we want to target another organ in the human body, we can do that. Show you here in the early days what we were able to we were able to do. These are images from 2003 research published in 2004 by our group, where we started from multiple carbon nanotubes, treated them by strong oxidating agents. In particular, here we boil them in nitric acid, obtain shorter and straighter nanotubes. These are multiwall nanotubes. We can tailor uh, the, the morphological characteristics of the nanotubes by adjusting the solution of the nitric acid. And then we grew a nanoparticle of silicon dioxide, uh, silica, uh, uh, as it is normally called, by uh, taking advantage of the defects that we created in the nanoparticle on the nanomaterial by the oxidation. The oxidation will put a lot of carbon COH groups, uh, carboxylic groups, uh, on the surface of the multi wall nanotube, and we will use these uh, groups as a docking, as an attachment for new, uh, very complex molecule. It's, a, it's obtained by a, a, a precursor uh, in, a, in a complicated uh, but uh, standard technique of growing nanoparticles in a micelle. Micelle is actually reverse, is obtained not in oil in water, but in water in oil, micro emulsion. And inside these micelles, we can grow with a predefined size a nanoparticle of silicon attached, bond chemically to uh, the carbon nanotube site where the defects are. And here you see the real examples of the devices we created with the nanoparticles that are placed in different defective sites of the carbon nanotube. We can uh, engineer these devices for uh, applications. Now, we need to immediately worry what is the biocompatibility of this device. And here you see a complete study that was carried out by our group already in 2004 to assess the cytotoxicity of this type of uh, devices. Here we study proliferation, how the proliferation is uh, uh, changed. But in particular, in this slide, I show you the apoptosis. So that is the programmed death of cells induced by the presence of this of different doses of these carbon nanotubes modified appropriately. And you see different, uh, different signals of the apoptosis. For instance, uh, in panel B, you see <clears throat> uh, pycnotic nuclear DNA condensation, blue or purple, and membrane blebbing, two typical features of a cell that is undergoing apoptosis. So now we stop and take up more questions. Uh, Stefano, yes, we have many, and the one uh, I would like to submit you is really related to, 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 to biology. So, um, Rita asked if uh, can we um, ultimately use nanoparticle to, to change the cell itself uh, completely, for example, to turn a prokaryotic into an uh, eukaryotic. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I never thought of it. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody doing that. And uh, at the moment, I cannot imagine what would be the strategy to do it. But I will keep this in mind. And if you write me, <clears throat> uh, I will try to give you a more concrete answer. I I'm not prepared to answer this question. And uh, another um, question concerns uh, the, the fact that since um, this nanoparticle enter uh, our uh, body, um, can happen that the, the body uh, recognize this as uh, uh, an, something harmful and attack the nanoparticle. Can we avoid this? Good question. Uh, here you see in this slide, I'm using, probably I didn't mention, but it's written in the slide in A, panel A, you see that immunofluorescence images of uh, JURCAT cells. What are JURCAT cells? JURCAT cells are T cells, part of our immunitary system, and we back in 2004, believed that these cells would be the most interesting to study when they face the, 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 the entry of a nanoparticle in the body. It turned out after several years of study that, in fact, uh, these cells are not the most involved ones. Um, phagocytes are mo mostly involved with treating nanoparticles uh, and clearing nanoparticles from our body. So the question is, uh, that is why I, I need if I want to use nanoparticles for drug delivery, 
I need to preserve them in the in the hematic um, in the circulation in the blood circulation. I need to keep them by artificially. Otherwise, our immunitary system will get rid of them right away. So the question is uh, very well posed, and the answer is that we engineer the nanoparticles according to their use, taking into account the interaction with the uh, immunitary system. Um, another question concerns more a, a physics uh, behavior of, of this uh, object. It, and the people is asking if we have account for quantum effect while working with nanotechnologies. Very nice question. Nowadays, this is one of the topics where the interest of um, uh, different governments is being put. Uh, the two areas of application of quantum technology uh, are mainly uh, space and defense. <clears throat> uh, quantum technology, uh, nanotechnology can help a lot in quantum technology. In fact, I must say that the European Union has put now 1 billion euros to finance this type of researches uh, in a, what is called a flagship uh, program, similar to what was done before with graphene. My group was uh, part of this graphene flagship uh, starting in 2014. Uh, more recently, this uh, quantum technology flagship is assessing uh, how quantum features can help technology. And uh, from the nanoparticle point of view, for instance, quantum dots, are, which I mentioned at the beginning of in the first part of my talk, they are certainly quantum behaving features. Any device that is based on, uh, for instance, superconducting materials uh, with nanostructures will display interesting features from the quantum point of view. It's a science that needs to be further developed and the technological applications are just at the beginning. This is one of the most fertile areas. And if you have more specific questions privately, I will be happy to address to relevant literature. There are also questions concerning uh, morality, let me say, ethical uh, problems. Uh, and uh, which is uh, your opinion in, in this uh, respect? Well, I mean, my opinion is very pragmatic. I mean, a hammer is a hammer. You can use it to, to put a nail uh, in, a, in a useful device that will uh, give a, hot, a shelter to a homeless person, or you can use it uh, to, to hammer a person in the head. Uh, these are tools. It depends how we use them. Thank you, Stefano. I think we can go ahead. Please uh, tell us something more. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, the road becomes more plain, we are going to talk about successful uses and safe uses of nanotechnology in health and the environment. So I'm now specifically focusing on uh, medical applications. So biocement is the first application I want to consider. Uh, first of all, considering bone applications and then tooth application. So uh, it, it's been in use now, biocement, for curing uh, uh, different diseases. Uh, here I show you how uh, an infiltration of biocement can uh, fix up uh, microfractures at the level of vertebra. It can be also done at the level of skull. And here you see dental applications. They're commercial. This is a, uh, a toothpaste sold in, in Italy, uh, which uh, fixes problems uh, in um, different parts of the tooth by introducing nanoparticles uh, as a repair in them. Let's get into more uh, uh, advanced uh, topics like uh, cancer therapy. Uh, targeted nanodrugs have been used uh, for now decades to cure uh, or to help the therapy uh, in oncological applicative areas. Uh, here I reviewed with my collaborators uh, uh, the state of art about six years ago. Now, let me give you an example, very old example, 2003. Uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. So this is a magnetic uh, application. It can be done by other physical methods. It's essentially hyperthermia. Hyperthermia is a therapy for cancer that is in use since the 1950s, very old. However, it, it, it basically boils down to uh, frying the tumor. You put uh, uh, a needle in the tumor uh, tissue and put the temperature and heat it up, up to, up to what? Up to 45, 46 Celsius. That is the temperature where cells are, uh, are, being, are breaking up. Uh, they are wrecked. 
And so uh, the problem is that you, 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 you essentially ruin the whole tissue, not only the tumoral cells. Here, nanotech can come to the rescue to help to make this therapy specific. So rather than uh, frying the whole tissue, it's going to heat up only the tumor cells. How do we achieve that? There are many ways. Uh, other ways I didn't mention, I, I'm not going to mention here, just briefly, have to do with radio frequency and gold nanoparticles. But here it's uh, magnetic nanoparticles, actually super paramagnetic nanoparticles. Uh, concretely, these are oxides, iron oxides, Fe2O3 in gamma phase. It's a particle that when you apply a magnetic field, gets a magnetization switch off the magnetic field, the magnetization vanishes, disappears, change the, the direction of the magnetic field, you change the direction of the magnetization. So easily by uh, introducing a magnetic field that oscillates, you can obtain an oscillating particle. This oscillating particle means, in an ensemble of particle, means increasing the temperature of the group of particles. Now, it's very easy to send the magnetic particles only to the uh, sick cells, only to the affected cells, by coating them with sugar. Sugar is, uh, of course, energy, and tumor cells are fastly replicating, so they need to suck up to ingest a lot of sugar. So they, they do that, then by oscillating uh, the magnetic field, we can increase the temperature, as is recorded in this uh, graph, up to 46 Celsius. Here you see preclinical tests of glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is a, is a deadly, is the most deadly form of brain tumor. Here you see um, the tissue of a rat, the tumor tissue of a rat, where glioblastoma has been introduced. And the nanoparticles are uh, essentially um, present in all the tumor, uh, the tumor of tissue. And then the treatment is quite uh, successful in the sense that um, it has been even tested on patients, 15 patients. It uh, makes uh, the life of the rats, uh, if I remember correctly, four times as long as the rats with no treatment. Here you see a thermotherapy of the targeted areas in the eye of a rat, and uh, the temperature reaches 49 Celsius. Of course, it's very interesting to use this type of uh, therapy at least to weaken the uh, tumor and then use uh, uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but also to reach tumors that cannot be, uh, cannot be achieved, cannot be reached by surgical treatment. In this sense, the magnetic properties allow us to uh, marry therapy and diagnostics. It's well known since decades that we use magnetic fields uh, for diagnostics. This is called magnetic resonance imaging. It is based on the injection of magnetic uh, particles, uh, for instance, magnetite. In this experiment, uh, <clears throat> magnetosomes have been used. This is a particular type of um, drug delivery particles. Here, they're used to uh, carry magnetic particles on them. At the same time, as you observe the the tumor in, in vivo, here you see a mice. Uh, at the same time, with the same magnetic coil, you can achieve the oscillation of the magnetosomes and so induce by apertermia the disappearance of the tumor after 30 days of treatment. Here are the details, uh, which we don't need to get into now, but the point is that you can deplete and document the depletion of the tumor uh, at the same time. So that's why we call it Theranostics, therapeutic and diagnostics. That introduces the notion of diagnostics. Diagnostics normally is made by large laboratories. Laboratories that work uh, with different uh, analyses carried out manually. What we want to do is put this entire diagnostics on a simple chip. This is exemplified here. You see a chip that is smaller than your credit card where the on-chip lab is able to provide an instant analysis by fusing and sorting, for instance, here two trains of droplets. There is a microfluidic device with a railroad-like channel and a guiding track. Now, 
Sensors can be a very wide class of devices for diagnostics. Here you see sensors based on spectroscopy. It's a physical uh, characterization technique invented by an Indian physicist, Raman. That is why it's called Raman spectroscopy. It's a vibrational spectroscopy that tells us something about the vibration of molecules and is able, when is conjugated, paired with nanotechnologically engineered substrate to uh, give us information about very small quantities of analytes of substances. This is called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. It is to, to use, it is to be used when the signal coming from few molecules cannot be observed. It's too small. So by putting these molecules on an engineered nanoparticle substrate, you can obtain a distribution of what they're called hot spots. On these hot spots, typically in the position of the nanoparticles on the substrate, the molecules that are being deposited on these hot spots give us a signal that can be a million times higher than the normal signal they would give on a standard surface without nano structure. So that gives us the possibility of, uh, of targeting and detecting substances from dangerous substances to tumor cells and thus uh, provide applications that range from anti-terrorism to, uh, to, the, to, the, to, to the hospital, to the clinical applications. <clears throat> um, this... Okay, it's exemplified here. Uh, we need to have biosensors also for homeland security, anti-terroristic. Here you see the surveillance area. Then you see a control center, which uh, is networked. And then you find uh, here on the right hand side, uh, the protection services that monitor the whole process. But the whole process is based on the use of a sensor. In the yellow uh, box on the bottom, on the right side, you see the analyte detection device that will be connected by this complicated network in order to survey, uh, for instance, the appearance of uh, a virus in an area. Biosensors based uh, on uh, DNA chips are also in use. In fact, this is part of a project that I directed, uh, financed by the NATO organization uh, between 2011 and 2017. You, you can monitor by, uh, well, you can analyze different samples, human samples uh, like uh, blood, uh, urine, or saliva, food samples if you want to analyze uh, sophistication or alteration in foods, uh, to environmental sample if you want to monitor the state of waters and uh, pollution in water, soil, or air, or vegetation. The intermediate step is to introduce bioreceptor typically enzymes or antibodies or nucleic acids, like we did in our project. And then you need to introduce a transducer. So that's electrical interface. That can be a nanoparticle, a nanoelectrode, can be a nanowire array. And then finally, you need the electronics of acquisition with an amplifier and a processor of the signal. Here is what we achieved uh, by electrochemical sensors uh, in our project. Uh, uh, we use... Uh, uh, composite materials where we inserted uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, carbon nanotubes modified by aminic uh, engineering molecules and uh, graphene uh, nanoparticles. And the performance as indicated by the peaks in the graph is not good for carbon nanotubes and is instead excellent for carbon nanotubes modified as well as for graphene because you see clear sh clearly sh peak shaped uh, curves that explains that testifies the uh, performance of the sensor. More recently, we use uh, a different type of application of nanotechnology based on optical properties. This is a project that uh, uh, I'm leading uh, since, last, since 2018 and will last until 2021 where we see different um, types of polymers uh, used as a matrix, where nanoparticles are arranged in a periodic structure using uh, holograms, using two lasers that create a, a holographic distribution in a, in, a, in, a, in a grinding or a lattice of these nanoparticles. 
that gives uh, uh, in endows the crystal. These are photonic crystals with specific uh, optical properties. For instance, a refraction index, which we can measure with extreme precision up to the fourth digit. Then the deposition of very tiny quantities of analytes, for instance, biological toxins or chemicals or viruses. How small? Well, less than 100 femtograms. Okay, so we're talking about 10 to the minus 13 grams can be detected by either the variation of the, re of the refraction index or the Raman uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which I mentioned before. So now I'm ready to take up further questions before tackling up the next part. I have to unmute my microphone. Uh, there okay. are questions concerning how you can target a tumor using a nanoparticle. So how can you really send the nanoparticle on, on the cancer cells? OK, sorry, I'm fixing my screen because something happened to it. Just a minute. Uh, how can I target? Yes, by OK, in the case of tumor, uh, typically we inject uh, the nanoparticles inside the tumor, for instance, by transperitoneal uh, uh, injection, if you want to reach the, the prostatic cancer, for instance. So now, in Germany, this cure, this therapy is in use uh, since uh, a decade in the hospital in Berlin called La Charité. And uh, other ways, uh, of course, uh, we can inject in the, in the blood and then put uh, some moieties uh, to target an antibody. Conjugated antibody. Another interesting question concerns the possibility to reuse uh, uh, nanoparticles. So um, th the question said th the nanoparticles are used only once or they can be used many times, reused, let me say. Yeah, well, uh, typically they're used only once. And uh, in fact, one of the problems we need to deal with is uh, how to uh, dispose of the waste. So Pretty much like we do when we change the oil in our car, we need to dispose this uh, waste uh, in a special, treating them as special waste. So, but the, the nanoparticles, uh, in principle, there's no point in reusing them. Uh, we can manufacture more. Uh, I don't think it makes too much sense. But of course, one can think when you have a device made of nanoparticles, uh, maybe I will not have time, but uh, one thing we do is producing filters to for water remediation made of, uh, graphene uh, platelets, then because the material is costly and because the material uh, is difficult to, to, to treat for waste, in this case, we regenerate the filter by different methods, for instance, inverse pumping or uh, electrical fields. So, but it's a, it's a good question. Uh, insert, it depends. Uh, I wouldn't uh, talk uh, so much at the level of particles, but recycling uh, the, uh, the device is made of particles. I'm sorry, but we are running out of time. So, uh, Stefano, please conclude uh, your, uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Now uh, we are uh, going to tackle the issue of nanovectors for drug delivery. So this, uh, let me introduce first the therapy based on the controlled and targeted delivery of drug. Basically, I want to illustrate why is it, this is interesting. Uh, we have problems with all drugs nowadays in our society, because uh, we need to achieve a desired uh, range of uh, uh, concentration of the drug in the body in order to obtain the desired effect. This is exemplified by this blue band or pale blue band uh, in the graph. Now you see that the minimum level and the maximum level are well defined. And in my model, I inject the drug or I give a pill uh, in a dose that is amply sufficient to uh, be in the desired range. In fact, normally the drugs are given to a level that is a little bit higher than the maximum desired level. So that explains why we have side effects. Side effects are due to the fact that for a certain time, the level of drug is too high. But that's because this uh, concentration of drug is going fast down. Uh, and so we need to give a second dose. You are familiar when you take uh, paracetamol for your fever. After 12 hours, you need to take another dose. 
Now, if you use uh, drug delivery using nanoparticles, the situation is completely different because one single dose can be enough for a very long time to give a concentration of the drug that will stay below the maximum level, thus killing completely side, undesired side effects, and at the same time, uh, making it minimal the need to repeat the dose. What do we use as a vector? Well, we can use liposomes, we can use nanocapsules, we can use dendrimers, depending on the specific drug and depending on the specific disease. Here I show you an example, nose to brain delivery. There is a problem. When a drug is swallowed, we have a blood barrier. This is called a blood brain barrier that does not allow the drug to uh, reach the brain. So that explains a lot of the difficulties that now we have to treat, for instance, Parkinson, Alzheimer, but also antidepression or dopamine uh, is not uh, reaching very efficiently the system. So what if the drug is now for curing a neurological disease? It's not a drug for curing, uh, I don't know, headache, but uh, curing specific neurological disease. Well, you can have three uh, situations. The drug crosses happily the brain, the membrane, very rarely, and reaches the brain or it takes care of the pathology only indirectly because it cannot cross the blood barrier and so the blood brain barrier and so you're not using the proper drug and you have a lot of collateral effect because you need to give a lot of the drug or you have an invasive care you inject lumbar injection or uh, surgical treatment now an alternative is to take advantage of the term the axonic terminations of the olfactory bulb you use two transport routes through the nose the axonal transport and the transport between support cells. Here is a graphical representation of the axonally mediated transport on the right hand side. You see in the step one on the left of the image on the right hand side, dendrites absorb the drug. Then the axons allow the drug to be transported and then streamed into the brain. This can be delivered by a very simple device like aerosol that allows to deliver it uh, to the olfactory nerve, olfactory bulb, and then to the brain by self-administration. To do that, however, we need to solve the problem of clearance. There is something in the nose that is called mucociliar clearance. The cells of the nose are equipped by cilia. The cilia move in a synchronous way to eliminate everything, powder, pollen, viruses, to eliminate the drug and send also the drug, unfortunately, and send it uh, to the rhinopharynx and then to the stomach and uh, elimination. That's why we decided to use muco adhesive nano vectors. The solution we practiced last year, encapsulating a drug, we use dopamine, and that allows to increase the retention time in the nasal cavity. So that allows the drug to reach the target. This is an example of drug delivery we successfully achieved with the financing of the Italian Ministry for Health 2011-2014, uh, collaboration with the Rome Pediatric Hospital called Bambino Gesù. And uh, we delivered uh, essentially micronucleic acids, micro RNA using carbon nanotubes. Here you see the vector we prepared is carbon nanotubes conjugated with a polymer, with an aminic polymer. Both ingredients are toxic, but when they are conjugated suitably, engineered, the toxicity dramatically drops down. They are loaded with uh, micro RNA and then delivered. Uh, here you see the in vitro analysis, uh, an example in transmission electron microscope of the internalization, the famous biocorona I showed you in the second part of my uh, talk. You see the vacuola that has been created inside the cytoplasm of this uh, UVEC cell. This is a UVEC cell, a model, cell model. And uh, in the vacuola, you can see very magnified uh, uh, images with uh, the bar is 200 nanometers of very short carbon nanotubes and uh, aminic polymer uh, loaded with the drug. In vivo, what we did was to put this uh, um, therapy uh, onto a mice, onto a several mice, and we documented uh, the increase by more than a factor two in the uh, lowering of the symptoms. Essentially, uh, this uh, this disease, uh, which is the is a disease affecting the epithelial lungs of children, is this is why it's called 
pulmonary hypertension, pediatric pulmonary hypertension, essentially is a deadly, deadly disease. In nine months, children normally die. This therapy allows the number of blood vessels and the length of the blood vessels to be kept under control. And that gives interesting perspectives in general in all the diseases that have to do with uh, uh, vascular uh, uh, degeneration. So vascular remodeling and therapeutic uh, 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 angiogenesis can be uh, achieved. In a few minutes, uh, I want to fit the graphene, which would deserve... Uh, Stefano, but it's, uh, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you, but we are really running out of time. Thank you very much. And uh, so I think that I will pose you just a, a, a question that is, uh, um, since you said that the, the nanomaterials enter the, the cell, um, is there any risk that they remain there and cause, for instance, some damage? So how can uh, we are sure that the, 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 these materials are then ejected by, by, by the body? No, they are ejected. The cells, uh, it's documented that the cells normally uh, uses uh, its own standard means uh, to implement exocytosis. However, the real uh, challenge now where people are working is the, uh, how to say, the so-called digestion of the nanoparticles. We, we can use, uh, in fact, uh, there are experiments using, simulating what happens uh, through the leuco leukocytes. It's the leukocytes in our body that are doing the job. And the same action can be simulated in the laboratory using uh, myeloperoxidase of human origin to degrade uh, carbon nanotubes, graphene, any type of nanoparticle. And it's very successful. The, the biodegradation produces uh, catabolites that can then be kept under control, at least in the lab and in tests in vitro uh, so far, in preclinical -cl pre tests. So I'm very optimistic about this, that we can uh, achieve a complete cycle of endocytosis, exocytosis after the release of the interesting uh, load uh, carried by the nanovector, namely the drug. Thank you, Stefano. I remind all uh, the attenders that they can contact directly Stefano if they have uh, questions. You see, you, see my, you see my email in this slide. That's why I put it on. So thank you again, Stefano, for the very interesting talk you give us today. And my to pleasure. everybody, I said uh, we will reconvene in another room for uh, another talk about, uh, uh, again, uh, nanotechnology. See you later. <laughs>